Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Athena Williams, the um, Adult Services Manager at the Kate Waller Barrett Branch, and I'm here with Patricia Walker, who's the Branch Manager of Local History. Uh, we're going to get started soon on our book talk on a Scottish migration to Alexandria by Ellen Hamilton. And um, both Local History has a copy, although it's not um, circulating, but the Barrett Branch does have a copy that can circulate. And um, also, if you're interested in purchasing the book, uh, we will have in the chat that you can purchase it at yellow.publishing.com. Um, while we're waiting a minute to get started, um, I will give an introduction on Ellen. Ellen Hamilton is a writer and artist who's been in Alexandria for almost 30 years. She gained interest in Alex Alexandria's history from serving on the Alexandria Archaeological Commission for many years. In addition, through her frequent trips to Scotland, the Scot Scottish Lowlands with her Scots husband, she learned more about Scottish immigration to the US. And through an Alexandria Times article on William Gregory, she chose him to be the subject of her book on Scottish migration to Alexandria. Um, please, um, as I said, she won't be taking questions during the presentation, but afterwards, uh, any questions you might have, you can put in the chat and, and um, she will address them then. And um, let's see what time it is now. I think we need to go ahead. What do you think, Ellen? Okay, yes, I'm ready to go. So I, I can't see everybody, but um, I don't know if everybody can see everybody, but I did want to introduce just a few people here. So I'll just go ahead and get started. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Ellen Hamilton, and today I am talking about my new book, A Scottish Migration to Alexandria. I am delighted to see you all, or not see you all, but either way, I'm delighted that you're here. Um, and there are two people who, here who have uh, been very helpful to this project uh, from the beginning, or at least there are two people who have been helpful, I'm not sure if they're here or not, but uh, one I know is here, and that is Pete Gibson, um, and he is a descendant of William Gregory. So I discovered Pete through uh, materials that were given to me by Don Dahman, uh, and Don is from the Presbyterian Meeting House. He is the uh, Meeting House historian, um, and so many thanks to both Pete and Don and so many other people who have helped me out. Okay, so let's go to the first image. Our first image that we're going to have is, is a map of Great Britain. Um, and I, there we are. And I just wanted to say that uh, well, this project happened, it all happened because I married a Scot. So a Scot is what you call somebody from Scotland, not Scotch, but Scot. And a Briton is somebody from Great Britain. So Scotland is a part of Great Britain. I had to have all this explained to me when I met my husband. I soon realized that I am of Scottish descent but this story is not about my family. My husband is from the lowland area of Scotland, which is full of people. And I began to wonder if, because this area around Glasgow is so heavily populated and industrial, if most immigrants to America actually came from this lowland area rather than from the highlands, as I had always assumed or always thought about. So I will begin with the story of Scotland before we get to the part about Alexandria. Uh, we can go to the next picture. Okay, here we have the map of Scotland. Uh, my subject, William Gregory, came here to Alexandria, not from the Highlands, but from the lowlands of Scotland, from a town called Kilmarnock, which we can see here, which is a 20 minute drive south of Glasgow. William's family were owners of a carpet weaving factory in Kilmarnock. We can go to the next slide. Uh, the next slide shows the map of the of Renfrewshire and Ayrshire, two of the most industrial counties in Britain. And it shows here the rivers that flow, um, uh, the many of the rivers that flow north and into the River Clyde. 
And because of that, water wheels were built on these rivers as early as the 1100s. These wheels brought water power to Scotland, water power which led to the modernization of Scots. Next slide, please. And this is William Gregory, and this is William Gregory from Kilmarnock, Scotland, as a young man. The family was very good at always having people documented and paintings made at the time. So we actually do have a number of, of great images of the family, many members of the family, which many I just got uh, just recently. Okay, next uh, picture, please. Uh, the next picture is a photo of Kilmarnock today. And uh, this is the main square in Kilmarnock. It's called the Kilmarnock Cross. And I was gonna tell you how many towns in Scotland, often the main central square is called the cross. And I think that's because uh, many towns had a large stone, a sandstone cross, often ornately carved with Celtic carvings. Um, and so that's why it's called the cross. In the middle, that is the statue of Robbie Burns and his publisher, uh, John Wilson is on the other side of that that on that plinth. Uh, this is Kilmarnock Cross and this was the photo was taken just two months ago right before um, the book went to print. In fact, it got taken for the, the book. Uh, and so this was September and there's the market there. So uh, let's go on to the next image. The next image is Kilmarnock Cross in the 1800s, I believe. And that is going to be the same square uh, that you were just looking at. It has John Shaw at that time in the square. Uh, the John Shaw statue was later uh, switched out with the Robbie Burns. The John Shaw statue is now up by the Dick Institute, which is the major museum in Kilmarnock. Um, so uh, let's see. So the Gregories ran a weaving factory, which was right to the right of that large, impressive sandstone building on the right. And it was also right near the Kilmarnock water. Uh, water in Scotland is what they call their rivers. And we can go to the next image. And the next image is so exciting because this was the map of 1819, which I dug up. I found this rather large map. It was, and I could get right down into the map and look at things. Um, so this is a small portion of the map of Kilmarnock in 1819, which was shortly after William left 10 years after William left Kilmarnock. And as I was looking at this map, I was so excited to find this little line crossing the river here. That's Kilmarnock water. And you can see above it says Rob Thompson and Sons Dam. So the Thompsons were the business partners of the Gregories. And um, I was excited to see this little line. You can see from the dam, there's a little line, and that was the mill stream leading over to a cluster of buildings. It's right about in the center. Um, and I figured that this was an early weaving operation powered by Kilmarnock Water, and this may well have been the business which belonged to the Thompsons and the Gregories. I actually went there later and, and visited that spot and tried to find remnants of the, the dam. It was very difficult to see any remnants, but uh, Anyway, right now there's just a big park there. Well, let's move on. Oh, no, not yet. No, let's stay here on this image for now. Um, I was going to say when I started my writing, I wondered, well, how far back will I go to look into this history? I thought, well, the 1800s is pretty long ago. I guess I'll start in the 1800s. But I soon discovered that actually everything happened in the 1700s. You cannot write about the 1800s without first speaking about events that took place in the 1700s. My most interesting discovery of this project is that British people changed from living a primitive lifestyle to the modern life as we know it today, and that change happened in the 1700s. There were two major events that led to this change. One was the Union of Scotland and England. And the other event, the second event, was the Cotton Revolution. So let's go to our next slide. And this is going to be the map again that we saw uh, earlier as the map of Great Britain. And it shows the Union of 1707. 
uh, in 1707, Scotland and England were joined into one country. This meant that the two countries were no longer at war. In that sense, it was maritime war, really, mostly. So a lot of ships would go out and, you know, shoot at each other. And then the other, the English would come back. And anyway, a lot written about that. Um, but this union of Scotland and England to create Great Britain changed everything. Scottish ships could now leave Scotland and they were now protected by the British Royal Navy, which they had would not have been before. So this, what that did was this allowed people, lots of people to leave Scotland, which they couldn't really do very easily before 1707. So most, most of our ancestors, most migrants uh, came to the US after 1707. Okay, next picture, please. Uh, the next photos I'm going to show you are, were taken actually in the Highlands in the early 1900s. So it's photography, so it's later. But I picked these out. For one thing, they were fascinating. Uh, but I think they show us what life may have looked like in the lowlands before 1707. Before 1707, Scots were extremely poor. 90% of Scots did not live in towns. Uh, there were very few towns and there were no roads because there was no government, no central government to build roads at the time before 1707. Instead, most Scots, 90% uh, of Scottish people lived spread out all over the countryside and they lived in a clusters of family dwellings called farm towns or farm tunes, as the Scots say. And they lived on land that belonged to a laird or a landowner. And they were tenants of the laird um, and their families had lived there for hundreds, possibly thousands of years, many generations. And let's go to the next slide. The next slide is a uh, picture of a man plowing with a wooden run rig Families had lived on their land for generations and they plowed their same small plot of land using crude wooden plows called run rigs. They paid rent each season to the landowner, not with money, but with their own crops. But over time, the land produced less and less food as we know it does. Uh, now we know that they didn't then. Um, when there wasn't enough food. However, there was sort of common land around, you know, everything was informal. He was lots of grouse and berries and just common land. And you could go and forage for food if you didn't have enough. And let's um, move to the next slide. And the next slide is a photo of a man who, uh, some people were working with peat. Um, digging peat for heating and cooking. So Scots literally lived off the dirt. In Scotland, there were very few trees, but, and even to this day, there are very few trees really in Scotland compared to what we're used to in the United States. Um, but the ground was full of roots and that dirt, that sort of plant matter filled dirt was called peat people would dig up the peat in squares and they would lay it out to dry. And in the very wet, you know, country of Scotland, it took up to several months for peat to dry. And when it had finally dried, uh, they would take it in, as you can see, and that peat was burned for, uh, for heating and for cooking. Let's go to the next uh, slide. So uh, this one is about weaving. So from at least the 1100s, Scots were using water power to make linen out of flax plants. I'm gonna wait for the slide. I'm gonna keep going. There we go. There's a funny illustration of a weaving, weaving factory, a weaving business. Um, so, so from at least the 1100s, Scots were using water power to make linen out of flax plants. So there was already a fabric manufacturing industry in Scotland for a long time. In fact, 
uh, linens were sent to London. Scotland was the main source for the bed sheets, linens as we call them, because they were made of linen, linen and that were sent to, to London. Okay. Um, now the next up, I had a picture of a weaver in Paisley. Um, I think we've gone one too far, but I'm gonna keep going, doesn't matter, because um, we're still basically on the same topic of weaving. So, nope, go the other way. There we go. Okay, so this is a weaver in Paisley. Paisley is the largest uh, town in, um, in Wren for sure. And um, this, uh, this is in a museum in Paisley, which I got to visit there, is called the Small Shot Cottages. Um, and so cotton arrived in, Scot in Scotland from America in the mid to late 1700s and it was picked by American slaves. This forced the price of cotton to drop by 50%. They were being flooded with, with slave picked American cotton uh, in, in Scotland. And this, the drop in prices in cotton, in cotton and this, all, you know, this large amount of cotton coming in, this created a huge incentive to transition from linen weaving to cotton weaving factories you were going to make a lot of money with this. And so uh, we can go to the next slide. So because of this, and this was the cotton revolution that I talked about. And over a very short period of time in the late 1700s, 1760s to the 1790s, uh, many, many of these cotton, um, cotton factories and cotton manufacturing buildings were built all around Renfrewshire and Ayrshire. Uh, and this is a picture of um, cotton mills in Paisley. And uh, it just was, it took up a massive amount of space. There's an enormous building, four or five stories tall. The walls were, you know, I don't know, several feet thick. Uh, and so what happened was with all these factories being, being built, uh, the factory owners needed lots of people to manufacture cotton fabric, which was going to be exported all over the place. So they needed people. Well, this created a ex population explosion and people moved into the lowlands of Scotland, people everywhere needed work. And so when the word got out, people moved to the lowlands of Scotland from the highlands of Scotland, from England and from Ireland. So we can move uh, to the next slide. Um, so this, they, these are the tenements in, in a small town on the Clyde River called, uh, called Port Glasgow. It was actually, the book describes, it was the, the port, it was built to be the port for Glasgow, but people were needed. Uh, so Port Glasgow is a nice example of the many towns that were built quickly. Uh, street grids were laid out and these buildings were built quickly, actually from wood that was brought in from Canada but that's a whole nother story. And you can see here Port Glasgow, and, um, the, and these are some of the tenement workers. They lived in buildings called tenements. Okay, let's move to the next one. All right, so in Paisley, they, these buildings still exist. You can see, uh, so this is a picture inside one of the uh, weaving factories, or uh, actually was a thread, a thread mill, a thread spinning factory in Paisley. And they have a museum there called the Thread Mill Museum in Paisley. And I met this lovely man and he showed me all, all the things they had. And he showed me this photo. And uh, let's go and look at the next slide, which is that photo just closer up. Uh, and this is a photo of the Weaver women in Paisley. I should say much later, of course, when there was photography. But um, so just to make the point that in the 1700s, um, people began moving into towns. So for the first time in the 1700s, towns were being built where there were hardly any towns, only a few before. Now people were being pushed off the land and they were being moved into the cities. Um, factories were being built and people were moving into town and they were earning money for the very first time. And this changed life to the way we live today. This was life-changing um, a time. 
Okay, uh, let's go to the next picture. Ah, yes. The next picture is my map showing William's journey. Here we have Renfrewshire and Ayrshire. And that is probably about where William went based on old maps that I was looking at. So in 1807, William Gregory was 18 years old. There were now nine children in his family. It was decided that William would travel to America as his father had done earlier. And this is probably the route William traveled on a horse-drawn carriage with his trunks, his mattress, and his pillow to Scotland's largest deep water port in Greenock. We can go to the next one. All right, there's a scene from Greenock. I took that, never mind the lens flare in the middle. But anyway, this is what you see when you stand in Greenock looking out over the Clyde River. Uh, and those are the Western Highlands beyond. We can go to the next picture. Uh, and this next picture was great. They had this photograph at the ocean terminal in Greenock hanging on the wall. So I actually took this photo of the picture that was hanging there as an aerial view of Greenock, uh, showing the River Clyde. Those are some lochs that come down from the north across. Um, and there's the ocean terminal there with that enormous ocean liner there. Uh, the Greenock port has always, is a naturally deep water port. It has always been very deep. And so that is where people would leave from to, to travel to America. Most Scots traveled from this port uh, to come to America. Okay. So, and from that point on, ships would uh, travel, sail out and to the left, that would take them south, and then they would go out past Ireland and on to the Atlantic Ocean. So here we have steerage. Um, most people had spent all their money and uh, just to travel in steerage for 11, eight to 11 weeks at sea. This area, which was sort of between decks, as it says there, uh, this area was damp and, and smelly and rats were a problem and diseases were passed around and maybe there was enough food. But if your voyage took, say, 11 weeks rather than eight, maybe the food was running out. Often this happened and people arrived in America sick, half starved and penniless. We can move on to the next slide. And here we are going to get to Alexandria for the first time, our first view of Alexandria. And it's going to be a map of Alexandria. This is a map that is in the library, Alexandria Library Special Collections. Uh, it's Alexandria in 1792, so it's a little bit before um, William arrived, a little bit before George Washington died. Anyway, um, in the late 1700s, when Alexandria was not even 50 years old, it was only three blocks deep and eight blocks long. And let's move on to the next picture. Um, the next picture, I'm going to show you Alexandria's waterfront. Um, Alexandria's waterfront was quite a working place. Uh, and there were many warehouses and saloons on the waterfront. This is a fantastic photo. I think it's in the 1800s, but I actually don't know the date on this. Uh, maybe the librarians can tell us. Um, but I started looking this to see if I could see what's what. And you can go to the next slide where I have kind of zoomed in a little bit onto the center of this, um, kind of a close up. Because I, so in Alexandria, the main port of Alexandria in those days was at the foot of Cameron Street. So our main street in Alexandria is King Street. And I suspect maybe where my little red circle is there on the left in the middle, I think that might be King Street. And that beyond that here, <laughs> something happened. We got a different, a gift, different image here, but I'm gonna keep going. Um, Alexandria's port was on the foot of Cameron. Uh, and even to this day, at the foot of Cameron, you have, uh, you have uh, a, a very large um, pier. And many of our ships um, tie up there still at the foot of Cameron Street. OK, so I just um, marked in a few things. I don't know, but I suspect that 
just beyond you there, if you look closely, you can see that there's a water inlet where my red arrow is the Orinoco Bay. Um, so I suspect that might be that. And then I was interested and I saw over here on the left, hills at Orinoco Bay, question mark. So today there are no cliffs or anything like that. It looks like there are some sort of low cliffs. That's all. I just sort of wanted to show, show people this. Um, let's move on to the next picture, which is about cockfighting and betting in Alexandria, which when William arrived in Alexandria, he was shocked to find out that betting was allowed on a Sunday. He wrote home to his parents and said, you will not believe. And uh, sure enough, there was horse racing and cockfighting and, and everything you can imagine. And he said, the betters are all out. And so in Scotland, this was not the case. Scotland, Scotland, Sunday was a day for church. Uh, but not in America, life was different over here. Okay, let's go to the next uh, picture where I'm going to show you an old, old photo of King Street uh, very early. And you can see Alexandria is known today for its brick buildings, but in the beginning, <clears throat> most of Alexandria's buildings were made of wood, which you can see here. And when William arrived in 1807, streets were, for the most part, unpaved. Some had cobblestones, but uh, many were unpaved. And let's go to the next picture where we do a little comparison shot and we show you Alexandria's waterfront today. And that's all I got on that. We can move to the next one. So uh, when William arrived in Alexandria, he had to cross the Potomac River from Washington to get to Alexandria because there was no bridge at that time to Alexandria uh, from Washington. So it was all ferries. And the very first, uh, one of the first bridges on the Potomac was built the next the year, the very next year after William arrived in 1808. That was the Long Bridge. And that bridge, um, a, a later version of that bridge, actually the metal version today, uh, is a railroad bridge. The first Long Bridge was made of wood, obviously. Um, but you can see here, if you traveled across a river on a ferry, you took your entire, all your passengers, your your a horse in your wagon, and everybody got on the ferry, and it may have looked something like this. We can move on to the next picture. Okay, so uh, Peter Gregory. William was all by himself at Mr. McRae's in Alexandria for his first 10 years. Once the American economy began to improve after President Jefferson's embargo, the trade embargo was lifted, Mr. McRae needed more help in his store. Now, Mr. McRae was also from Ayrshire in Kilmarnock, in, uh, in Scotland, from the Ayrshire County, which is there in the Lowlands. And uh, so he rather liked having, you know, guys from his home country there to help him, help him out. So he wrote a letter to William's father in Kilmarnock and asked if Mr. Gregory could send another one of his sons. There were plenty to help out. So Peter Gregory was the first brother to come across. And I had never seen a picture of Peter. And if you've read the book, uh, you'll recognize the name. Um, and so uh, this image was sent to me after the book was printed. And so uh, it is the first time I had ever seen Peter after all these years of working on this. So I was very excited um, to see this. So uh, moving on to the next picture. And this is the Bartleman house here in Alexandria. So William worked for Mr. McRae in his dry goods store. Dry goods means, and this is news for some, dry goods does not mean dried noodles or dried beans. <laughs> Today, people are always saying, we sell dry goods. We're a f food place, you know, we sell, we sell noodles. No, 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 that's not what it is. Dry goods meant fabrics, rugs, or carpets as they call them in Britain, clothing, hats, cording, any kind of fabric-y type of thing was dry goods. So after 15 years of living in Alexandria, William, uh, much to the relief, I think, of his family, finally married uh, Margaret Bartleman. So Margaret was the daughter of the prominent Alexandria businessman, William Bartleman. So our William lived with his in-laws, the Bartlemans, in this house at 207 King Street. 
and today it is the Son Sonoma Winery uh, or Sonoma Wines. I guess it's a very nice uh, restaurant. And moving on to the next picture, where I am going to show you uh, the 400 block of King Street. So in the late uh, 1820s, William bought his first properties along with a partner and built his first row houses at 400 and 402 King Street, which is Caddy Corner across from our city hall. And we and I'm pointing it out there, those two shorter ones. And notice before we go on, the notice the storefront, okay, the way it kind of looks, you can just barely make out, it's kind of old style there. Let's go on to the next photo. Um, and this is going to be the 400 block in the 1960s, and these are William's buildings uh, seen in the 1960s. This photograph was taken right before they were demolished. In fact, the entire city block was demolished in the 1960s, um, and every building that was demolished was photographed carefully by the archaeology department here in Alexandria. So thankfully, we have records, and that's why they did it, so we have a record. Um, so, um, and that was to document the buildings before the whole block was torn down to make way for the more modern buildings that are there today. Uh, we only have two more to go, so let's move on to the next picture. So, um, this is 329 North Washington Street. In 1831, William bought the Leadbeater House on North Washington Street for $4,000. It was just two stories at that time. Uh, I think you can kind of make out a change, uh, just a bit of a change in the brickwork there. I think I could tell over the over the second story windows. Um, but at this point, William now had experience with building, so he added the top two floors onto this house, and he needed that space because this house was to house nine children from two wives and several slaves. And there is a side yard there to the right behind that tree where William planted one tree for each of his children. And in the back of the yard, which slopes downward a little bit, of course that slopes down a little bit towards the river here in Alexandria. Um, the river is back a couple blocks be behind that house. Um, in the backyard, there was a brick firing kiln and later on, the children would play, played with bricks that were left there. So I believe that possibly the bricks for building this building were actually fired in on the property. I actually did a bit of research for that, trying to find out where, where were these kilns? Where, who was making it? I realized, oh, it was in the backyard. So uh, we can move on to our last photo. And this, this is William Gregory as an older man. And this was sent to me by his descendants. Uh, William had four children with his first wife, Margaret, and Margaret's story is told in the book. And he had five children with his second wife, Mary, and William's descendants are spread out all over the United States. And uh, some of them are here with us today. Um, I also tell the story of William's sister, Mary, and her migration to the Northeast US and of several of his brothers and what happened to them. So that's pretty much the end of my, uh, my talk. I just wanna say, I just want to add that this has been the greatest project of my life. I had so many great photos, sketches and writings sent to me by people from both sides of the Atlantic and uh, I felt that this story about the modernization of people and population growth in Scotland in the 1700s was one which is not really widely known. And since I am familiar with the landscape and the histories on both sides, I felt that I really needed to tell this story. Uh, that's sort of the end of my talk. I have one more note to add, and that is I have exciting news. I have um, and this ties in with where you could find the book, but I have just signed a lease for a very small retail space here in Alexandria uh, for my shop where I have the book for sale. And my new shop is at uh, 2101A Mount Vernon Avenue. And it's a very small townhouse, so it's very exciting and I'm just moving in. So that's my news. Uh, and that is all for now. 
there is much more in the book. And do we have any comments or questions? Um, hi, Ellen. Well, thank you so much for your presentation. Sorry about the little snafus here with the, <laughs> moving the slides. <laughs> well, you came through it very well. Yeah, well, th thanks to uh, Tricia. <laughs> anyway, uh -huh. um, there were a few questions. Um, I'm going to reverse the order because um, we might have to go to a different slide for the first Now, is one. there any way where I can see people? Uh, not in the webinar. Not in the webinar form. Oh, this okay. Is the, okay. Yeah, the Zoom webinar, you don't see the people. <laughs> oh, well, okay. Here, I can, um, I'll click on the participants and I'll see their names. Yes, you can. Um, so okay. um, someone asked, what are the sources of the maps used in this presentation? I made those maps. So, oh, okay. So meaning uh, the source for the map. Now, if it's the old map, I went to uh, the National Museum of Scotland in Edinburgh, I believe, I think that's where they have it. There are some Scottish websites where you can go and get some old maps. Um, I think it's called Canmore, but uh, there are a lot of sources, but it helps if you go to the National Museum of Scotland in Edinburgh on their, their website, and uh, you can find those, those maps. Uh, the colorful ones, of course, I, I did the illustrations myself, but I think they wanted to know where I got the, the old maps. Okay. Um... And the other question is, can Ellen ID those areas that were bombed in World War II? I think they mean with this slide here. Areas that were bombed in World War II, where? Hold on. We're trying to bring up the... Um... So I did not research World War II on this project at all. Okay. <laughs> I was living in the 1700s, basically. Um, okay, we're not sure. Okay, well, that answers the question. Though. Yeah, I don't know what, what side uh, they're talking about. Um, yeah, we're, we're unsure which, which slide. Oh, it says Glasgow bombing, she oh, responded. Okay. Oh, well, I can answer that. Clyde Bank was bombed. Clyde Bank in Glasgow, which is the north shore um, of the Clyde River. And that was lucky for the Scots because the Scots were actually, uh, you know, had a, this is not my topic now, so I should, probably shouldn't go off on this, but uh, they had another manufacturing plant on the southern side um, near Bishopton. Um, but uh, yeah, Clyde Bank was heavily bombed during World War II. It was completely flattened, it was a disaster. 